Hey, what's going on? What's up, Happy everybody? Happy Thursday. You know what time it is? It's Brother Empowerment time. And if this is your first time watching, we always like to let you know that Brother Empowerment was designed to uplift our brothers. This is not a platform to bash and to say what we're doing wrong, but it is an actual time to have a conversation and look at things from a different perspective. So um, if this is your first time, welcome. We see some familiar people already on. We got my wife, Lolita. Hey, sis. And if you didn't have a chance, um, she was actually on last Check week. Out that video. And it was great to have my wife on, um, my wife, his sister, yep. to go over and just have different conversations. So um, hopefully she'll be back. <laughs> the real folk was watching them go ahead and show you. Shut up. Um, gotcha. And then, then we got Corey that's on. What's going What's on, up, Corey? Bro? What's up, bro? And then Michelle is on. Hey, Michelle. You know, Michelle is going to be active when we kick off our junior advocate program. Yeah, big things. Big and I'm things. so excited because she got boys and we're going to help shape. Yeah. Um, so she don't have to even feel alone anymore because you got a team yep. that is going to help you. Um, and you are doing an awesome job as a mother. And so I'm definitely excited about everything that is going to be happening. But before we get into this, how was your week, bro? So my week was... Uh, it was interesting, bro. So I just um, I had a lot of time to think this week. Mm -hmm. I haven't really been doing a whole lot. So I mean, aside from going to work and going to the gym, I really just been really just been thinking. I've been reading my love, you know, what I'm saying love advocate book that I bought. <laughs> been reading that. Uh, so that's I mean, if you haven't picked up one of those, definitely cop one of those. It's I mean, that material is just out of this world. Michelle, we got your um, copy, too. I told her already, so. Um, but, yeah, my, my week, bro, has just been, uh, I think, just like last week I mentioned, too, just, uh, just a lot of introspection, um, and I've had a lot of time to think, and it's just, it's really just been a chill week. No, nothing, nothing too extreme on either end. It's just been really chill. So, how about you? Man, um, I guess we share the same experiences on a lot of that. Um, my biggest thing is I learned a lot about goal seeking mm -hmm. and praying. Okay. <laughs> um, because I realized just this week that a lot of times we pray for things or want things. And in the back of our mind, we really don't think that we're going to get them. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't take away from the fact that it doesn't matter if we get it or not. It's the motivation mm -hmm. and, and, and the desire to want it. Yeah. So um, sometimes we set these real high goals. And in the back of our mind, we're like, I won't get it. But at least that'll give me something to strive for. Yeah. Because some people believe goals are not meant to be met. Mm -hmm. They believe that they um, are always to raise the bar. Like if you can meet a goal, it becomes now the standard. So you want to keep yeah. on going. Yeah. Well, I realized with all of the great things that are coming in, I was talking to Corey today on the phone, like all the great things that are coming in, um, I didn't know if I was really prepared for it. Yeah. Because I wanted it, I prayed for it, um, I set a goal for it, and now that it's happening, I'm like, well, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. So those things, um, it really taught me, and it really humbled me to say, you know, if you really want something, when you get in the presence of it, mm -hmm. um, Look at it as something you deserve. Yeah. Not something you like, ooh, what do I do with it? But say this is something I deserve and embrace that experience. Yeah. Next thing, I was so excited to get in the mail the re release of Random Thought Spaces of a Poetic Mind. Mm. Um, the 24th of January was the eighth um, year mm -hmm. anniversary of when I released this book. It was more of it was so funny. I was like, I need to get this book out before I get any other book out yeah. because it talks a lot about how poetry really saved my life. Mm -hmm. um, at first, it was just going to be a book of just poems and things like that. But it says the best on the back. It says when people ask me um, what type of book this is, I often answer, I don't know. All I do know is that my intention was um, initially to write a book of poetry. I wanted to show my appreciation for the gift of poetry. It is there that I feel vulnerable, misunderstood, and lonely. It is there that I receive acknowledgments, accolades, and encouragement. So poetry was there for me a lot. Um, a lot of people don't know, like, um, I struggled in middle school. Um, I had a learning disability. Comprehension was the problem. They thought it was reading. Had a wonderful teacher by the name of Miss Akusani. 
in seventh grade, I went from a fifth grade reading level to a ninth grade reading level. And so words just became something amazing to me. And so I don't ever take it for granted. If you would like to get a copy of this wonderful book designed by yours truly, I'm actually kind of geeking about it um, because I did release it as an ebook and then actually seeing it, it's like, wow. Yeah. Um, you got the beginning and I actually see why I did this though because um, Afafa is so different mm -hmm. than random thoughts. I'm like, it's needed. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the things that I'm most excited about. All right. That's a great compliment, bro. Thank you, my brother. For real. So we're going to get into these questions. Because we have 12 topics. million topics. Right. So many. So many. Oh, uh, we got my mom on. Hey, mom. Hey, mom Garnett. Um, Michelle, you ain't got to tell us thank you. We in this together. We sure are. Then it's Lavinia that's on. Hey, Lavinia. How are you doing? We got Uncle Marcus that's on. What's up, Uncle? Uh and then we got Melissa that's on. Hey, Melissa. We got Tashia that's on. Hey, Tashia, love mate. So a lot of the comments, um, a lot of the topics that we have, we kind of um, just went on and put them together because the main thing a lot of people was asking us about is how we feel about the um, Kobe and Gianna situation yeah. um, along with the seven others who transitioned um, in that horrific um, helicopter crash yeah. so what we're going to do is just we're going to go over it and we're going to have a conversation about it but we probably won't talk about it long um cordell and i have been talking about it really all week in a sense of the reason why we don't want to talk about it too much um because for one it's already emotional mm -hmm. for two um we don't like the sense of people using tragedy um as propaganda or capitalization yeah and so we definitely don't want to take the loss of something that, you know, Vanessa Bryant is going through yeah. along with the other three daughters as a platform to catapult, to catapult what we're trying to do. So we're going to go over all of them. We're going to answer it and we're going to keep it moving. Um, something in line of the recent helicopter tragedy seems appropriate. Um, one said the takeaway from the Kobe Bryant tragedy. Um, what did Kobe mean to you? What did he mean to black men? Hashtag girl dads and the difference between raising a black woman and a black man as a black father. Mm -hmm. um, then the question to me, Jay, how do you feel about being a father of two girls? Are you a girl dad? Um, CG, um, do you look forward to being a parent or even a girl dad? Want to jump into it? Yeah, man. I'll start from top to bottom, man. Go ahead. You go. So takeaways from the, the tragedy. I mean, takeaways is that it's a tragedy. I mean, it's you know you have nine people who lost their lives. You know, a few of which were young people. I'm not gonna call them kids. You say young people. Yep. I mean, they were just literally starting their lives, and it's there's nothing. There's nothing good that can be said about that. There's nothing inspiring that I can say about that. Nothing. It's a tragedy, and it's uncontrollable and and lives were lost in an instant and can't get them back so the takeaway is that tragedies suck and that life is you know it's it's life is precious and yeah tragedies are just are not, there's nothing good or positive about tragedies at least for me um well for me um i think that it's one of those, I struggle with the fact that one of the blessings of getting older mm -hmm. is that you have more experiences, but you have more losses. Right. And um, my first major like star that I felt the connection to when they transitioned was actually um, Aaliyah, mm -hmm. because we were born in the same year. Seeing, seeing her, seeing your birth year mm -hmm. and seeing an end date changes your perspective. Um, on a lot of things. So for me, the realization of life is so, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's a thing that we have to be, it's going to be a mm -hmm. transition where we transition from this to a more spiritual consciousness. But at the same time, it still is a struggle. And no matter how prepared you are for death, you're not prepared. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then also thinking about 
two things of how things work. Um, looking at their relationship, it was obvious that they were extremely close. Right. Um, how would either one of them live without each other? Yeah. So it was almost like a beautiful thing for them to go together because I don't think either one of them could live with themselves apart. Yeah. Um, to be a father of girls, um, I've always wanted to be a dad of girls. Mm -hmm. um, partially, I wanted to bring young women in this world and kind of prepare them, not prepare them, but help be um, a standard in their lives. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I didn't want boys because I feel like life is extremely hard and difficult. Mm -hmm. And the survival rate of a young, you know, black male is hard. So yeah. I really didn't want to bring a, a, a boy in this world. Um, and so fortunately for me, it was answered, mm -hmm. but that doesn't take away the fact that I got nephews and things like that that yeah. I look out for. Um, it's just that I, I don't think that I could live with constantly worrying mm -hmm. about, you know, if my son is going to come home or not. Um, but I love being daughters, um, having daughters. I love being a father. Um, what Kobe meant to me was that um, it was a reminder of what you could do mm -hmm. in 40 plus years. Um, the beauty is he had a helicopter to get in to die in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so it, I, I think about he left a mark and I look at transition sometimes as when you've completed when you've completed your task, sometimes I feel like you get the privilege of transitioning early. Mm -hmm. So I don't look at it as a horrible thing. I look at it as he may have accomplished all the things that he needed to accomplish in a soon enough time. And the same for Gianna and the same for the other seven. I feel like um, it was purpose that they transitioned when they did. Mm -hmm. And I have no choice but to believe that they met their assignment as well. They just were, you know, um, overachievers and were promoted well before all of us because if you think about it we're still trying to figure stuff out yeah so i don't look at death as oh it was a horrible thing in a sense it was a horrific way that they transitioned mm -hmm. but i don't look at death as a bad thing i look at it as a promotion and so it was nine people um that got their promotion and i feel like because they completed their assignment so even a teenage girl you know a young girl like gianna she finished her assignment before some of us yeah i mean that's and that's definitely a, a nice, I don't say nice, that's definitely a different way of looking at it. As far as what Kobe meant to me, I mean, basketball is my favorite sport. So Kobe to me was just the upper echelon of athleticism and just talent mm -hmm. mixed with hard work. What he meant to me as a black man, aside from being a ball player, was that one thing I all admired about Kobe was his work ethic. Kobe Bryant, when he first got to league, there were certain things he couldn't do well. And it was, of course, talked about by people who analyzed his game and this and that. Oh, he can't shoot that well. His defense needs work. He's not great, this and that. Every single year, Kobe Bryant worked in the offseason to improve things in his game that were weaknesses or viewed as weaknesses until finally, not finally, he was always looking to improve. But at the height of his career when he retired, there was really nothing that Kobe Bryant didn't do well. He shot the ball well. He played defense. He, he was on all defensive team. He, he could basically score from anywhere on the floor. He was – he just did everything. And to me, that is how I strive to be in all assets and all areas of my life. My – I would like to think that I work continuously to be better in all aspects of life because getting complacent or being like, okay, well, I've arrived. I'm, I'm done is one of those things that really can hinder you. So I always, the work ethic that he had to me will be my most, the thing that stands out about him to me the most. He was always working, always working. He didn't care about how hard it was or what he had to do. He was always working and always shooting for the next level. And I will always admire that about him. That was about to get out, huh? Feels better now, though. <laughs> now when he trying to be funny, I was yeah. like, yep. Yeah. I know how it feels because, like, Scottie Pippen is my favorite of all time basketball player. I love Scottie Pippen. And um, Kobe to me was somebody that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. So, kind of like Ruby Hustle. I yeah. feel like I grew up with her too. We don't know each other, but in my mind, I feel like, you know, 
we at least was yeah. on the same in the same neighborhood. Kind yeah. Um, so I definitely get that. Brian, what's going on? What's up, Brian? Isaiah, what's going on? What's up, Isaiah? We got um Kim. <laughs> <laughs> yes, was, we're not even gonna say that, we're gonna say Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sick of her, man. Yo, these days just get more, you know, but we know it's for a purpose, but, you know. Benita's, what's going on? Benita, what's, what's, what's going on? Hey. Tara, what's going on? What's up, Tara? Um, Nakia, what's going on? Hey. Um, Lavinia said that I've been thinking about death this week, um, and it was meant for their soul to transfer to another vessel. Yeah, I have heard that, too. Uncle Marcus said his was Mar um, Michael Jordan. He was Michael Jordan for your generation. I guess talking about yours. Yeah. Well, it's not a mine, but yeah, I'm partial to Scotty Pippen. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he was a Scotty Pippen of our generation. <laughs> <laughs> Kimberly Dix is on. Oh, what's going on? So now that we didn't got that out of the way, the last thing I'll say, as far as me looking forward to being a parent or a girl dad, I look very much forward to being a parent. I mean, it's for something that I've, I was on the fence about when I was younger. I didn't really decide definitely that I wanted to be a dad or slash parent until I was about 28 or 29. Before that, I'd wake up one day and just say I could just throw it out the window. I don't really care about it. So I definitely do want to be a parent. And I would love to be, you know, a girl dad if that's what happens. I think that would be just right in my alley. I'd have my daughter or daughters would be spoiled. Yeah. But I would love to have daughters or a daughter for sure. I feel like I'd be the disciplinarian in that marriage. I'd have to come in because really? both of y'all would be, yeah. It'd be horrible. Yeah. That'd be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I already think because you let my girls get with me anything. Wait, what? Yeah, they just say anything and hug and you just like turn into mush. We had to discuss it later I don't think that's the truth. Hey, then you even get the kid voice. Like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you know what? <laughs> next question, next topic, please. Next no, topic. see, I was trying to move on, and guess what happened? You wanted to go back no, to I, this situation. I finished the last. Okay, yeah. Next topic, please. Done talking about. Rest in peace to all the people who passed on. Now, who's uh, who's responding? That's love is a parable. <laughs> oh, you know that's gotta be that's 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 probably gotta be sis. That's, that's, that's gotta be sis. <laughs> I'm about to take away everybody's privileges. <laughs> That's gotta be said. Tashia, it's probably Tashia. Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, recognizing signs when you are depressed or having an anxiety attack. Uh, well, as far as as far as depression goes, you know, Jay, you take us from first, sir. See, you see how he didn't know what to say? He was like, yep. I, I flip it. Um, instead of always addressing like what the signs of mm -hmm. um, depression and anxiety are because they are related, Yeah. Um, let's not assume everything is depression or anxiety. Yep. Um, because what has happened is we have become so label focused mm -hmm. that you can't just be sad. You can just be sad and not be depressed. Yeah. You can be in a deep thought and not be sad or depressed. Yeah. Um, you can be nervous about something. You can be anxious about something and it's still not anxiety. Um, I think that we should not look for signs of mental um, illnesses or mental, um, mental needs, but start looking for reasons to just help. Yeah. So if a person is down, Talk to them. Yeah. Um, if a person is nervous about something or seem anxious about something, talk to them. I think um, finding labels um, has really become a thing of our detriment. Mm -hmm. And we continue to look for labels. And then after a while, those labels mean nothing. And then they're lessened, like the ones who are really dealing with those things. Like for me, I deal with um, clinical depression. Mm -hmm. um, Half for years, got medication to prove it. Um, it lessens it for those who are really going through it. And if you haven't gone through the process and being properly diagnosed, don't self-proclaim to be or struggle with depression and don't be quick to label someone with depression. The only one that can truly determine those signs are professionals. And um, I think that we need to get back to just enjoying life 
and appreciating life, meaning the beauty of life is sometimes having those valley moments, just like having those mountain moments. So you're going to have those valley moments, but it doesn't mean you're anything. Just like when you have those high moments, that doesn't mean that you won't go through another valley experience. Um, it's just all about perspective. But the one thing about whether it's a valley or a mountain, you can always enjoy the scenery. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I think definitely the most, the, the most important, well, all of it was important what you said. I think one of the most key things, though, was sometimes a person is just sad or having a moment. And I think instead of just, like you said, labeling it or going out there to really just diagnose someone, check on them first and see because you checking on them may just bring them out of what they got going on or it may help so much that they get out of it sooner. But the key, I think, is to check on people and reach out and tap in or stay tapped in with people first before you do all, you know, this, the other stuff, the diagnosing and it's this, it's this and that or, you know, you suggest, or even suggesting. Be a listening ear or if, if that person is like a sounding board first before you do anything else. Like, you know, just stay tapped in with your people. That's one thing that I do first. I don't suggest anything. I don't, you know, diagnose anybody. I just, just hit people up, hey. I want to tap in with you. I've heard from you in a while. How's everything going? Or, hey, what are you doing? We've got something going on. You, you okay? No, or you want to go out and get a drink? You want to get something to eat? Or, you know, you just want, you know, you want to slide by or whatever. So just, just stay tapped in. I think that matters a lot. It matters a lot more than labeling stuff, in my opinion. And Lavinia says she agreed. And um, Kim said absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And then Kimberly Dixon said true sadness is not depression. Um, Chanel was on it. She said, this may be a conspiracy theory, but depression is a way to drive capital. Mm -hmm. A label that leads to pharmaceuticals. And now they push onto our kids with ADD, ADHD, not saying they don't exist, but the trigger is pulled significantly. Mm -hmm. um, to that point, I will say this, like um, our daughter was struggling, one of our daughters was struggling with um, a transition. Mm -hmm. So my wife and I did seek um, professional um, help and in the session um, after just one encounter um, the the therapist tried to label our daughter as being oppositionally defiant mm -hmm. and not knowing that me and my wife both have um, behavioral health and mental health backgrounds it was like no way possible she can be that mm -hmm. not off of one assessment because um, oppositionally defiant is based off of a pattern yeah. And they got to consistently do something. Yeah. <laughs> and so how can you consistently say, how can you say somebody consistently does something in that first consultation? Yeah. And so we were like, no, not, not this one. And so she tried to explain it. And my wife and I both said, well, let us explain something to you. Yeah. And then we had to let her know our background. And my wife was like, no, because it means this, 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 and that. And we didn't have to pull out Google or any of that. It was like, no, that's not correct. Yeah. And you usually make that at least by the third or fourth assessment, right. not in the very first one. So I do believe that there is a propaganda side of it. Mm -hmm. and But I also feel like because of those things, it does lessen um, the impact of those that really do experience yeah. something. Um, that is, you know, kind of strong. Yeah. And then, yep, yeah, that's Tashia. She took my great handle on this topic. <laughs> um, how do you say her name? It's Stephanie. Okay, you do say it's Stephanie, like it's um, pronounced. Yeah, hey, Stephanie. And then Lavinia say, I agree with that also. I have PTSD and people don't take it seriously. Now, all of a sudden, everybody and their mama had it. I mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. Michelle say, check on me. I be needing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I try to, yeah. and, and I do special subliminal posts for you. Yeah. She has people who stay tapped in with her, so we make sure we get to you, Shell. That girl over there coming as loves and terrible. <laughs> Great job, Cornell. You, you guys color coordinated nice. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, Isaiah said, where are them friends at? I get tired of always reaching out um, to folks like that. Well, I mean, and I will say that as I've said before, it takes effort to maintain connections and it's a balance. If you feel like in certain connections with certain people that there's way more energy output on your part than theirs and it's not because they may be going through something, you think they may be going through something, then you have every right to evaluate that and to recalibrate how much you're putting out and to kind of just take a step back to so become more balanced or to just take all the steps back and just not 
tap in at all. You, that's completely your right, and because you have to maintain equilibrium for yourself as well. So if you feel like your friend, you have friends or associates, whoever, who don't reach out, then hey, you have every right to really say to say that and say, okay, well, I'm gonna just really just take a different approach. There's no, there's nothing wrong with that in my opinion. And people can be good people, but it just might not be good for you. That goes right. in any type of relationship. Yeah. And if you find yourself always overextending yourself, it may be some time to evaluate um, what boundaries you have either let down or never um, reinforce in your life because people will only do what we give them permission to do. Right. And we have to make sure that we know the difference. It's, it's okay to be a revolving door, but not a doormat. Yep. Um, you can let people come and go into your life, but they have no right to walk over you. And so you want to make sure that you are setting up those parameters, parameters and you are also setting the expectation of the things that you need. Um, all they have to do is agree to meet them or not. And if they don't, you have a, you have a decision to um, separate. And the truth of the matter is, um, in those instances, a lot of times you're trying to connect with people that may not be a good connection for you. Mm -hmm. And it's just like um, with some of the phone chargers. If you connect to the wrong phone charger, it will drain your battery. Mm -hmm. If you connect to the right one, it'll accelerate and charge. So you might be connected to a draining charger, and you just might need to get with a charger that is more compatible with the type of vessel that you are. Say that, bro. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, let people know, hey, you know, you always want people to reach out to you, but you never do any reaching out. You don't stay tapped in it. And let them know that you feel that the, the relationship is unbalanced. And, and like Jay said, if if they are if they're not gonna take any action or even really consider what you're saying, they need the wrong connection or wrong person for you. Well, like like the brother Jay said, right for somebody, right for somebody else, but maybe not for you. Right. So I don't believe in I don't believe in non reciprocal interactions or relationships. So if I feel like some friends that I have are not the relationship is not reciprocal, there's no balance in in the energy, the effort, I'm probably going to actually cut that off. And let, let them know at the same time when I'm cutting off, hey, I feel like this because of this. So I'm going to do this. That's how I feel yeah, about it. I probably won't have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it depends um, because I do believe that sometimes it's not right. Now, let's not confuse this with people who may be going through something themselves and they just don't have anything in them to give. And that's why I said first. So, yeah. Right. We're not saying that, you know, cut those off because you know the people that you're interacting with right. and you know what you tolerated. Um, so we definitely don't want you to be just one sided and say, oh, nope, this is my standard. And this, yeah. um, sometimes people go through things and sometimes they don't have it to give. Um, I know a lot of times people um, reach out to me and say, Jay, I need you here and I need you there and I need that. I'm like, I don't have it. Yeah. And some people, it seems like they always come at the time when I'm like so busy, but when I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't hear from them. Yeah. But when everything is going on, like, Jay, can you come here? I'm like, uh. so they may feel like I'm not um, in a reciprocal relationship with them. But the truth of the matter is, he's got bad timing. Mm -hmm. And um, they may want to just check and say, hey, what you got going on before the actual event happens. So um, it all it all goes down to like a great conversation. But at the same time, making sure you have uh, evaluated that whole situation as a whole. Yeah. Nikhil said facts and a check mark. What's going What's on, up? Sean? What's up, Sean, bro? He said, oh, <laughs> had to finish the set at the gym. See, I ain't mad at you. bro. The gym, that's life right there, man. Tell me, that's great, brother love. I'm so blessed to have the right charger at all times. My squad is dope. That's what's up. And then Kimberly can say, cut folks off when it's a consistent pattern and the relationship is one-sided. And we agree. Yeah, that maintain equilibrium. Rela raising teenage boys. Neither one of us have them. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I don't. But we have the teenage boys. So, yes. what are some things that you needed that you felt like weren't met um, when you were a teenager? Well, when I was a teenager, it was a kind of a tumultuous time for me, simply because my my dad and I's relationship was very bipolar at the time. Because sometimes we were good, and then other times it was a little on the rough side. Um, I talk about it some, but I, you know, I had a, my childhood wasn't, it was, there were some great moments and there's also some moments where I went through some abuse. So, and my dad's, the relationship between my dad and I is, is better now. But as a teenager, it was very just, like I said earlier, peaks and valleys. There was a lot, there were a lot of those. Mm -hmm. And I would say 
something that I needed but I didn't get as a teenager. I guess reassurance in my own voice and my own feelings. There was a lot more telling me of how I should feel versus ascertaining how do I feel. Gotcha. So I think that's very key when as a teenager, especially as a teenager, when you're coming into finding yourself and really discovering the world for the first time in a lot of ways. Yeah, I will say, um, I will say it this way. One of the things that hurt me more the most about um, the Trayvon Martin situation, and I always tell people this, um, it wasn't the fact that he was brutally killed. Mm -hmm. It was the fact that he felt as a young boy that he needed to handle it himself as a man. Mm -hmm. And far too often, we put the pressure on our young boys to be men when they're babies. Mm -hmm. Um, there is no such thing as a rites of passage into adulthood or even into manhood. And so we want to create that for them, but we want to be sensitive to that transition. And you, you got to think, this is, um, this is a, a statistical fact, but research has done this. Um, a, a black child is perceived to be two times bigger mm -hmm. and older than their um, non-black equivalent. So in life, they're already being judged at an older age. Mm -hmm. And if you have children that are growing into adulthood stature, yeah. sometimes you see them as an adult when really they're just a baby. Yeah. And we still have to work on that nurturing. Yeah. One of the things that I felt like I needed more as a teenager was really more affection. Yeah. Um, because I didn't get the affection that I needed, so I became completely um, alienated of, of, of emotion. And, and I did things, and I really didn't have any emotional attachment because of those things. And people thought, like, people would be in intimate um, settings with me and thinking that I feel an emotion. I feel nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I think that we need to reach out more um, instead of trying to we got to stop making them be men now. Mm -hmm. That path of being a man is a discovery. Yeah. And it's an uncovering of who they are and their true potential. And I think that one of the things that we need to do is just embrace our young boys because yeah. the world is going to do a good job at beating them up now. Yeah. Um, so you don't have to even worry about that because sometimes the one thing that hurt me the most is like Trayvon Martin was going to his dad's house. Mm -hmm. Why didn't he feel confident enough to run to his dad mm -hmm. versus running around to fight. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that says a lot about a relationship. Our boys should be able to run to their dads. Yeah, definitely. And that he was robbed of that opportunity and that hurts me even to this day. Um, and, I, and, and, and that's also reflective of our community. We need to start embracing our boys more. That's just how I feel about it. Yeah. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, Levine says she always asks, um, do you have a mental space for me to vent? Yep, very key. Um, Nichelle says she went to the gym today. Good That's job. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, Nichelle, we're talking about. And Nichelle said, y'all, y'all want one? A teenage boy. She's got a teenager. Let me tell you this. <laughs> you sent us a teenage boy. That's like forever babysitting, yeah. you would save us so much money. Send him this way. Michelle said, were you comfortable talking um, to your mom? I think she was talking to me. Um, or, I don't know. I don't know who she was talking to. Yeah. Let's know, let us know who you talk yeah. to before we answer. Um, Sean Stewart said, I had two. And boy, oh boy, is it rough. Especially for me. I didn't have a father in my life growing up, so I did my best. So I did the best I could do with a lot of trial and error. Yeah. And then Michelle say, come get Malachi. And then um, Tashia <laughs> said, I'm still learning my boys. Um, just learned today that my that my working so much is affecting my oldest. Yeah. And then um Kerwin say a well put. And then so Michelle said she's talking. Hey, hey Kerwin. Um, how you doing, my brother? And then Michelle says she's talking to both of us. Um, okay. Well, I answer, I guess I'll answer first. I didn't. Um, <laughs> he first. I feel I feel very cool to talk to my mother about anything. You know. She's talking back then. Oh, back then, even still, I've always felt comfortable talking to my mother. 
that being said, I didn't at that time. One, the issue of the conflict wasn't coming from my mother, so I didn't really feel comfortable talking to her about it. I mean, I did because I had no other choice. But the other thing is, is that I. I really didn't need to talk to my mother at that time. My my dad was the person that I needed to have those that real transparent and honest conversation with. And it, it didn't happen until much later, um, actually a couple of years ago, that we had those conversations. And, and as you can imagine, that conversation was full of backlogged, pent up stuff because there was conversations that, that needed to be had around that time that never were had. And so it has some adverse effects. But to answer your question, yes, I did feel comfortable talking to her mother, and I still do. My mother and I have a wonderful relationship. She is one of the most dear people to me ever in life. You know what? And I was just sitting there thinking. Um, guys, February 24th, we are launching our Junior Advocate Program. And so if you do have boys, bring them, um, because we do have a special initiative that we're going to um, talk about there. Um, fortunately, now we have an advisory committee, and we have parent um, – we have – we have an advisory committee, committee chair, but we also have co-parent um, advisory committee chairs who are going to help with that. And we have some things that I think that would be really great to help transition to that because we want to bring in some of those things that have been forgotten. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that just talking would do those things, but there are some real great initiatives that we want to implement that nobody else is doing. So you definitely want to be at that meeting and bring your boys so we can just sit down and talk and come up with a great plan and a great execution as well. Yeah. Um, because I do feel like just because we're not fathers um, of boys, we still need to do our role in that village. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you address single mothers working crazy hours to a preteen boy so that he understands. I would say this for me, like my mom always worked three jobs. Um, the problem wasn't that she worked three jobs. The problem was um, it was a lot of aggression mm -hmm. at that time. Um, and one of the things that we give our, our boys, and I see this a lot, and we, we, we think it's okay, like someone will say, well, I'm not gonna let my daughter do this, but my boy is okay with that. And we put this, we put this, um, all this pressure on our young boys, but we want to have conversations with our young girls and we need to start having conversations with our young boys and just showing them intimacy. Sometimes just talking to them and explaining it to them is a whole lot easier than trying to instill um, in them. I remember when our girls were mm, eight and six, that's when the first time I told them about why we don't um, really like them to spend a night because I was molested and I explained to them what it was. And so from that day, they kind of understood like, we'll go hang, but we definitely don't want anything bad to happen. So we're going to go back home. <laughs> um, and it was so much easier just having that conversation. And the same thing with my nephews. Um, when you match aggression with aggression, all you're going to get is more aggression. Yeah. But if you just come there with affection and just talk to them, a lot of times it will reside, and we gotta stop confusing expression with aggression. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't know the words to say. Sometimes it may come out angrily, but that doesn't mean that they are angry. Yep. Um, sometimes um, we are by nature very expressive people, and sometimes when we're passionate about something, the containment of that sometimes feels like, you know, that they are angry or attitudinal, but a lot of times they're just trying to find the words to say. And what we do a lot of times is cut them off and say, you need to say it to me like that or don't talk to me in that tone, but yeah. let's get out what they're trying to say and then help them say, okay, let's say this a different way and let's experience this a different way. But I think that we need to move away from the matching aggression and the quote unquote trying to instill. Because if you're doing all of the talking and all of the instilling, when are you doing an assessment of what they're really taking in? No, that's that's super key. And we don't always have to assume that they that that preteen boy or even girl doesn't understand. They may understand exactly why their parent or parents work so much. Like the brother Jay said, they just may have a hard time getting out how they feel about it. And that may be the whole issue. But they may understand perfectly well. So Nice, 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 Lori, and love is a parable too. I'm about to take everybody <laughs> right away.
Um, I think that that conversation, um, we as parents feel guilty a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we perceive the actions of our children from a guilt lens. Mm -hmm. I'm guilty of it as well. Um, my daughter told me it was something going on at school and she said, I just didn't want to tell you because you're always working so hard and I didn't want to bother you with that. And I'm like, yes, I'm busy, but I'm never too busy for you. Mm -hmm. And um, I needed to watch that because then from that point, I became extremely guilty about anything that I did. Um, and so I perceived some of the ways that she was acting um, from a guilt lens when really she was just either having a bad day, having a moment, just thinking, and it had nothing to do with me. And so we just want to make sure we're not putting so much on them and we're not, you know, anticipating so much that sometimes we creating a problem just because we expect a problem. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it just is what it is. So I, I, I just say, um, um, allow them to be their person. If they say nothing is bothering them, believe them, you know, um, but if you notice over time that their patterns have changed, have a deeper conversation with them, but don't have an accusatory conversation either, because to be honest, they do have a right to hold um, things that are personal to yeah. them and secrets to them. And sometimes we gotta respect their boundaries if we're gonna teach them about boundaries. Yep, exactly, I agree. Whew, that was a lot. Yes. We ain't gonna finish this, so I ain't even gonna try. We're gonna have this next week. Yeah, we're gonna have something for next week. So don't expect the topic post next week. I'm just gonna put the picture up and say, hey, tune in, and we're gonna finish next week. And we don't wanna hear nothing either. No, no, no. no. <laughs> what happened to common courtesy? Well, let's see. So I will say that nothing happened to common courtesy. I, from, okay, so let, let, let me start here. So, the whole movement of or the idea of this is missing from the entire world what happened to this why is it gone to me is a very just uh over exaggerated kind of wave common courtesy is not gone it's there you just may be running into people that have never really known about it or won't care to display it at all common courtesy is still there they're Still, quite a few people who believe in common courtesy practice it and preach it. It's not, it hasn't gone anywhere. You just may have run into some people who just don't care about it. You know, I hear that a lot, and, and one of the questions is going to go to this. I hear a lot of times, like, where is the support and where where is all of those things? And like for an organization like us, we're like, what do you think we've been doing for the last three years? Yeah. Um, be, but we really have to get out of that environment that we're in. Right. That's from the people and everything, regardless if that's all you know. Um, one of the things, I, I talked to my mom about this, like I don't have a desire to go back to Augusta, Georgia. For me, Augusta, Georgia had a lot of negative things mm -hmm. and a lot of bad experiences. I'm not gonna go back to Augusta and try to change Augusta. Mm -hmm. It's better for me to just find a place where I belong. And the same thing happens with, peop with people. I mean, I'm talking about family members, quote unquote friends, um, even employees. You don't have to be around the negativity. Right. And you have to make a conscious effort. If I'm in an environment where I don't feel supported, I need to go where I do feel supported. Right. We're skeptical of everything but a bad decision. Yep. We will question everything but a bad decision. We will give it full faith. And we got to move out of that. If it's good, go to that good. Yep. You're, you're worthy of that good. You're deserving of that good. There are people that want to support you. There are people that want to seriously love on you. Mm -hmm. And you're robbing them of the opportunity to go into an abusive type environment, a negative type of environment. I say, come out of that. Yeah. That's the very thing that we've been saying about this. I have so many conversations about people who support us and be connected to us, but at the same time, they're so skeptical mm -hmm. because they feel like there is some form of hidden agenda when it's, it isn't. Yep. Um, we are who we are. We are the same. Um, everybody will tell you probably that it's connected. We're going to argue. Mm -hmm. We're going to disagree, yep. but we're going to love on you equally, and we're going to want what's best for you equally. Yep. Um, and I think that um, common courtesy didn't go, go anywhere. Maybe we just connected to people who are not courteous. That's, yep. Yeah. Take a, take a, you know, evaluate your surroundings and the people that you're with. So one person is saying it's common courtesy um, perspective, and the other one is saying say that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't think common courtesy is, is a perspective. I, I think it's more of just 
I mean, I definitely think I it's. Do. I really do. Okay, but I mean, go ahead. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think that it's one of those things where it's you kind of just I, I won't say you just you know, but I really think it is. I mean, I think that you know when someone isn't being courteous or someone is being courteous, and you know when you're not being courteous and when someone isn't being courteous. It, I think it's it can be respectful. I also think, of course, outside of action, I think it's a feeling too. I know when I know when I'm not being courteous, and I know when someone else isn't being. I don't have to question it. You know, so that's just how I feel about it. I think that <laughs> hey, Raja. <laughs> um, I think that um, I think it is a perspective because sometimes, based on our own our own experiences, we perceive the actions of others to be. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, when we're not used to something, it's just like me. If it's not worth the effort or it makes sense, I probably would say okay. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people feel like when I say okay, it's like I'm being dismissive, and I promise you I'm really not. It's like, why have a conversation about stuff that makes sense? Mm -hmm. If your point made sense, I'm just going to say okay and do whatever you said do because it made sense. Yeah. But people want to have conversations after that, and they feel like it's common courtesy to explain why you said okay because it made sense. Well, I need more than that. I can't give you more than that other than it made sense. So it depends. Um, I think it, it does depend on the person. But you have to check your experiences, and that's the hardest part because a lot of people don't know how to check their experiences. You may have come from a place that have put you always on edge, so your natural reaction is to always be like, you know, to buck up at people. But that really doesn't mean that you are a mean person. You have just come from an environment where you, where um, self-defense was your first thing that you were thinking about. Um, so check the things that you're going through, knowing you're off balance. Um, one of the things that um, me and Cornell talked about, I, I forgot, Monday or Tuesday, mm -hmm. because of so many things that were going on, I felt my emotions kind of changing a little bit because of the highs and lows and the pressure and the, um, it's so much was going on. I felt my emotions change. And so before I was about to make a decision, the one thing I told um, Cornell, like, I'm not in the right place to make a decision because I'm, I'm not sure what's going on with my emotions. Mm -hmm. You know when you're off balance, you know when um, you know when you have a warped perception or you have a skewed perception about anything. So check yourself first to make sure like, okay, am I looking at this wrong? Mm -hmm. Am I having a bad day? Do I really just wanna snap on somebody? Do I have hidden aggression that I just wanna get out before we think you know, somebody else? So I definitely believe perspective is a large part of that. Um, Lori says she feel it is a per perspective. Mm -hmm. And then Rasha said, I think it is. Different people have different expectations. My norm comes off as rude to people. If not going out of my way to smile and announce my courtesies uh, specifically at work. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, I met Rasha when she was at one of her jobs, yeah. and I thought you were totally different. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I don't like talk. She's just so nice. But then I'm crazy anyway because I don't be knowing when people have a bad day. I just be like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought she was nice. So I'm the wrong person to say that. I can't see after meeting you. I can't really see how somebody would think that um, anyway. And I'm sorry that you even have to deal with that. Yeah. Sean said, am I wrong? But I hate it when I try to have common courtesy and open the door for someone in public and they can't even have the decency to say thank you. Am I being petty? Well, I don't think that's petty. So, and some people, for whatever reason, they may not want to say thank you, and they're not going to. So, Or feel like you're supposed to do it. Yeah, or, exactly. So I don't feel like you were out of line for really thinking that, man, they could say thank you. But you, I think that you getting upset at that, when knowing that, that's one, that, that is a possibility that's going to happen when you open the door to someone, they may not say thank you. I think getting overly worked up about it is doing yourself a disservice because that is a, a very possible outcome that you've probably experienced before. So I think that getting worked up about it is just not really worth your time. I say you're welcome. Yeah. Whether they say it or not, I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> Have a good day. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm a little petty. Look, I'm a little petty. <laughs> so <laughs> I get how you feel about it. Um, Roger said, I literally say you're welcome to keep them up. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> that is definitely me. 
<laughs> and then a rush says she's friendly, you know, and yeah. people just assume I have a tood unless I'm smiling. And it's so funny. I don't, I didn't see that. So I don't know. Yeah. But like I say, I do look, I found a long time ago, I actually do look for the positive in a person first. Mm -hmm. And I found out that I don't see what most people see. And I just tend to go with that. And I definitely did encounter that. And I definitely felt like you were warm and welcome. Um, I really did not feel that way. And remember, you met my daughters and my wife. Mm -hmm. And you left a lasting impression on my daughter. So, yeah, I definitely don't feel that way. Yeah, most of the time, I, I'm saying most of the time, the majority of the time, I just said it again, basically, whenever I, whenever I talk to Rasha and meet her, unless we're talking about, you know, college sports, it's generally a good, it's really a good time. She's generally nice. For some reason, whenever we, college sports come up, maybe basketball, it's a little dicey. But you know what I realized, though? Observation. I realized that I am attracted to people with extreme personalities. Mm. So if, like, if you're super confident, um, or if you just like extremely mean or extremely funny, nine out of ten we're gonna get along because I like people who are you know confident or um, sure of the decisions that they make. Yeah. And so it could be that you are very determined in what you want to do. And so I don't see that. I just see a person that's very driven, who's about their business, and who's very knowledgeable. I mean, extremely knowledgeable. Yeah. Sean said he agree with you, Cordell. He see your point. And Sherry said, you just, I am petty. I said, I said I'm a little bit petty. <laughs> but hey, Sherry. And hey, hey Sherry. Roger. Hey, Juanita. She's hey, on. Juanita. She said, come to my graduation viewers on February 4th. I'm a love advocate. Oh, yeah. We have six people graduating on oh, February dear. 4th. And what, five people being um, going through their refresher certification mm -hmm. on February 4th. So if you can, meet us at Office in Art, 630, um, and help a lot of the love advocates who are graduating to come on. Yeah. That's because you're a Duke fan, Cordell. That's what Michelle said. So Because. We're supposed to be better than this, okay? I'm not going to do this here. He's a dookie. Um, okay. So because this is Brother Empowerment, and because I have my book of poetry, I'm going to read a poem. And you're going to like it. You're going to love it. She's talking about why I'm drawn to you. Because you're crazy, Sherry. <laughs> I'm drawn to that extreme personality. Um, Nikita says she wished she could be on um, you, don't, you don't have to wish. You really could be. Yeah. It's a decision. Yep, sure. And once you make it, just commit to it. <laughs> so here goes a poem from my book, Random Thoughts, Phases of a Poetic Mind. It's called I'm a Man. Oh, so appropriate. Mm. I rise like the sun with inspirational points. I'm a man that keeps moving, steady grooving, fooling, fooling fools to wonder how. I go on and on, on my own, all alone, and I am a black man. From correctional minds to correctional institutes, what the heck they often get the boot. The boot from me without a message or a sorry behind plea. Oh, let's not forget the fee. The fee you made me pay for years and years and years and years to come. Oh, how cruel when I read the dotted line, it said I'll never be able to have it paid in full. But still, I am a black man. I was beat like Rodney when I tried to escape like who to black kings united under the Caribbean sun, but treated like none. Nonetheless, in the old cigarette bud. I was tarred and feathered and hung from trees, but you claim me as your friend to the end because my end would come a whole lot quicker than yours. But nevertheless, I am a black man. You claim me to be a rapist or a traitor. You call me a cool monkey nigga colored in a whole lot worse. While others fought to be called African-American Tell me, how can I claim the African without the Cherokee, the Blackfoot, or the white? While others sit back and grin, calling themselves African-Americans, you could just call me the Dark America, son. But still, to you, I am a black man. No colors, boundaries, columns, or checks can tell me who my brother is. Creed agree will be no test. For the love of my people, all God's children. So I will continue to go on and on and on till I reach the top, because I am just a man that didn't stop. <laughs> Yep, yep, that is Tuesday. Graduation is Tuesday. Next Tuesday. It's next coming Tuesday. Yeah, the Tuesday coming. Yes, that's what I said. You said next. It is next. It's the only Tuesday coming. Same thing. Nope, not the same thing. You'd have had her on the 11th. No. The 4th. The Tuesday is coming. After this Tuesday, this is next Tuesday. <laughs> so, here we go. We had the, we had the time. No, we, we, got, we got six minutes left. Five. We got six minutes? Yeah. Well, you still got to do your positive brother shout out. We can do one more topic, though. <laughs> no, we can't. Because last time, <laughs> what? Last time, that six minutes turned into a whole nother eight or ten. 
Blame it on sis. No, it was you. It wasn't me. Me and her both looked at you like, you still there. Wow. See? I'm going to go back and watch it again. Positive brother, shout out. <sighs> so. Positive brother, shout out. <laughs> so, now, positive brother, shout out. So, uh, first off, first and foremost, always got to shout out to Brother Jay. We here again doing this thing like we are every week, doing, you know, doing what we do and striving to make change and, if, you know, inflict positive, you know, energy or put positive energy out there. So, Brother Jay, definitely going to shout you out. Uh, shout out to Uncle Marcus. Just saw him early before I came, but shout him out. That's my you know, Uncle Marcus. <laughs> that's, that's my guy right there. Um, shout out to all the brothers here, Kerwin, Sean, all you brothers that come on every week and really inject, you know, some really thought-provoking comments and, and or questions into the live. I mean, we definitely count on you brothers to give your feedback and let us know that, you know, we're doing something positive and really making changes. I mean, because, you know, we're out here and we, you know, I want to say we're doing what we do, but also it's, it's nice to to get that bounce back from other brothers that, hey, I see what you're doing, or even to get some feedback. I mean, feedback is very vital. So shout out to you, brother. Shout out to everybody, all the brothers who are going to view this later, um, you know, and they're going to have comments on here later. So we look forward to, you know, having y'all live when we're on. But we also look, we also very much value your comments that come afterwards in your inboxes and everything like that. So um, that's it. It's all I got for this week. Sean said we should do an open mic, which is it's a hilarious, Sean, because we have done several. <laughs> um, but yes, you're right. We should. Um, one of the things that we are working with authors and art is we used to have Love um, Musa or whatever. And Love Musa or whatever is just that platform where you can come in and do open mic. You, you can dance. You can play a little bit of music. You can just um, relieve any type of stress. You can even paint. <laughs> so yeah. there's so many different things that you could do. But yes, that's one of the things that is our passion. And so we want to keep that going. Um, when the next one happens, we'll be sure to make sure that you're on the invite list. Yeah. I want to give a huge shout out because Jay got a new brother today. He did. See, the the the, the friends of Terry Henry committee mm -hmm. have got together, <laughs> you know, yeah. and the chair of that committee, Tara's younger brother, he accepted me into the fold. It's official. That's what's up. That's what's up. I'm an official brother of George Johnson. Yep, and Tara Lynn Johnson Henry is my sister. Okay. And we have closed off um, accepting any new brothers. Tara can't have any new brothers. That's it. We have met our quota, but she is accepting sisters on a probationary period. Well, Tara, I just want you to know next month, my application for brother acceptance goes in. Um, four year terms. Four year terms. You look at twenty twenty four. No, we're gonna make some special concessions for CG. I don't know. I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to give a shout out to yep, my new brother um, George. Have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give a shout out um, to definitely Kerr when I tell you you inspire me so much, bro. Yeah. Um, and I love the fact that you are the example. Um, you don't talk about a standard. You are the standard, and I appreciate that. Sean, I thank you for coming on and supporting us um, every week. Uncle Marcus, you know I love you, and you're my uncle, um, not his. Um, what? I'm just stating facts, guys, stating facts. He to, accepted new nephews. How about that? Right, after me. <laughs> I met the quarter. Made the cut. See? 2009, I was in there <laughs> same. <laughs> um, my older, my um, all of my brothers, my older brother Daryl and Vincent, Rodney, um, Tramiel, Mike, um, my brothers, I love you, and now George. Um, I definitely want to definitely um, say I appreciate you, and I think all the things that you guys are doing. My new friend Isaiah, um, Isaiah is actually going to come on the show next month. Okay, um, is Isaiah, he actually going to? So, he's going to drive down here okay. and be on here. Okay. We might have to put a little filter on this light, though. Why? It might be too bright. <laughs> <laughs> but Isaiah is definitely going to be down. So, um, brothers, we just thank you guys for everything. Corey, thank you. Um, Terrence, um, Tadal, thank you. Um, the ones who are helping us plan the Brother Empowerment Cookout. Mm -hmm. Remember, the Brother Empowerment Cookout is March 22nd. Be yes. there. Be in the place. It's a free event. We just want to have fun, listen to some music, eat some food, and take pictures. Yep. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely be in the place March 22nd. If you haven't had a chance, go ahead and get it because it's limited. We only accept in the honey. Look, a honey, not a hundred, a honey. Mm -hmm. We only accept them because that's the only amount of food we can pay for. Um, <laughs> so 
<laughs> Definitely um, come out if you can, guys. Um, we appreciate everything that you guys are doing, and we, we appreciate the support. And like always, bro, I thank you for this. Like I tell people all the time, I would have never probably have done this had I not had you by my side. But I also thank you for the things that you're doing for um, Love is a Parable, especially um, because you are the Chief Technology Officer. So I can't wait to get our CRM working yes. wonderfully yep. with mm -hmm. our website. Oh yeah, I look forward to that. Me too. I just know that you're going to do it, and I appreciate the way that you always deliver. Love you, bro. No shade. That was really <laughs> true. That was true. <laughs> it's just about bring food and drinks. <laughs> So look, my brother. Oh, look, my new brother. Oh, look, see, What's there up? you go. What's up, George? <laughs> my new brother is on. We in there. We done told him we're not accepting any new applications to 2024. After next month. No. Nope. You should, see, you missed the deadline too. I'll get that. It was in 2019. I'll, it was in November. I'll get in that office and filibuster. Y'all won't be able to leave until I get what I want. We'll call Kerwin. He'll handle the light. Wait, Kerwin. Kerwin's on my side. Call your people. <laughs> 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 but um guys thank you so much we enjoyed it um we look forward to seeing you guys next week and if, like we always say if you feel like nobody loves you if nobody is there just know that there are two people right here that really do love you and reach out to us at loveisaparable.com guess what you can even email us at jayden wayne garnett at loveisaparable.com cordell gibson at loveisaparable.com you can also inbox me don't worry this will be reciprocal interactions you reach out to me i'm gonna definitely tap in with you and i'm just gonna leave you on read i'm joking i'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> but thank you guys we love y'all good night all right good night. see y'all next week for more topics <laughs>